Hey guys, this is Donoid. So in today's episode of SGI History, we're going to be going over the late 1990s, from 1997 to mid-2000. Now, there were no MIPS product launches during this time, but they did release a couple of x86 products, and they got a new CEO twice. So there's certainly quite a lot to talk about, and let's get right into that. We return in the year 1997. SGI has just announced their new Octane workstation, which seems to be a success. Their O2, Origin series, and Onyx 2, released a year earlier, are also doing well. With their entire product line refreshed reasonably close to the same time, there wouldn't be much to say about their MIPS products for a few years. That, however, doesn't mean there's nothing to talk about. For a seemingly unknown amount of time leading up to the end of 1997, SGI CEO Edward R. McCracken had been planning to step down as CEO. In January 1998, Silicon Graphics named Richard Beluzzo as their new CEO and chairman of the board. After working at HP for 23 years, and by the end becoming their executive vice president, this was a major event in the history of both companies. While at HP, Beluzzo advocated a shift away from HP's HPUX and PA Risk platform in favor of Intel's highly publicized upcoming Itanium architecture and Microsoft's Windows NT. Once at SGI, his opinions on technology remained unchanged. Under his leadership, SGI reduced spending on IRIX and MIPS and began to work towards NT on Itanium instead. It should be noted that 1998, the year Beluzzo took charge as CEO, was also the year all IRIX updates began to be branded as 6.5.x as opposed to 6.6 or 7.0, seemingly signaling a loss of interest, at least from the marketing department. The same can be said for the MIPS architecture, which had major development initiatives for future chips cancelled in favor of making improvements to the existing R10,000. All that said, SGI was still doing well, and this shift of focus didn't make their MIPS products any less capable. In fact, since they had just refreshed their systems and nobody was expecting upgrades for at least a few years, Beluzzo's effects on the company would not be immediately visible. SGI's next big news would come on January 11th, 1999. This news was the release of the Silicon Graphics Visual Workstation 320 and 540. Though Itanium was not yet available, it was SGI's first system to run Windows NT. Because Itanium wasn't out yet, SGI shipped the 540 with four Intel Pentium 2 Xeon processors, and the 320 with two. These systems were aimed at the low-end workstation market, with both systems falling below both the Octane and O2 in terms of price. Just a few months after that, on April 13, 1999, SGI announced that they were changing their corporate identity from Silicon Graphics to simply SGI. While their name was still officially Silicon Graphics Incorporated, all products and marketing material were switched. With the new name came a new logo and font, as well as a redesign of the SGI.com website. The reasoning, as given by Richard Beluzzo, is as follows. Although the marketplace sees us primarily as a leading provider of 3D graphics workstations, our core offerings also include servers, supercomputers, and global services. This change to SGI provides us with a broader identity that more appropriately communicates the full breadth of products and services we offer. Though the visual workstation had fulfilled the workstation side of what SGI called their dual platform strategy, SGI still did not have an x86-based server to accompany it. That changed on August 2nd, 1999 with the introduction of the SGI 1000 server family. Family. This included the SGI-1200 and SGI-1400L, which were available in rack mount or desk side form factors. Interestingly, rather than Windows NT, the 1000 family ran Red Hat Linux. Though SGI practically never released sales figures for their products, it appears that the 1000 series was significantly less successful than the Visual Workstation, which is itself seemingly only moderately so. We now return to Cray, a company SGI had acquired only three years prior. The Craylink-based Origin and Onyx 2 lines were very capable systems, and work on a new architecture codenamed SN1 was underway. SGI, however, seemed to have gotten everything it wanted out of Cray, because in August of 1999, SGI unexpectedly set up a separate business unit for Cray Research, in preparation to separate Cray from SGI. Then, on August 23rd, 1999, something unexpected happened. After just a year and a half at SGI, Richard Beluzzo left. Replacing him as CEO and chairman of the board was Robert Bishop, who had been an SGI employee since 1986 and is credited with building their international division. While it seems strange that Beluzzo would leave SGI less than two years after leaving HP, where he had worked for many decades, he would go on to become president and COO of Microsoft, which he also left after a year. Returning to Cray, as expected, on March 2nd, 2000, Cray Research was sold to the Terra Computer Company. Terra then renamed themselves to Cray Incorporated and continues to operate under the name today. 
Moving forward a few months to June 2000, we now turn our attention to another company, the Intergraph Corporation. Intergraph was planning to move to the software industry after 31 years as a hardware company. They sold their workstation and server divisions to SGI. The addition of Intergraph's ZX10 servers and workstations to SGI's product line added a second, completely different x86-based product alongside the SGI 1000 series and Visual Workstation product lines. So that was part 5 of our History of Silicon Graphics series. As you can see, there were no MIPS products, but plenty of x86 ones, as well as some other miscellaneous company stuff. Now, next episode, there will be some new MIPS products, as well as, as you'll notice, Itanium hasn't arrived yet, so there'll be some Itanium stuff, finally. So, uh, if you did enjoy the video, then please do subscribe, as it does still help us grow, we're quite a small channel, and until next time, bye! <laughs>